So we're going to talk about uh, two laws of thermodynamics uh, I want you to know. Okay, but first there's, there's a couple odds and ends I want to get to. Um, we, we're talking about the flow of heat Okay, which uh, really is another way, uh, the flow of heat, another way of thinking about this is um, the transfer of thermal energy. Okay, now there's three different ways that this happens, that you can transfer thermal energy from one you know, place to another place or from one system into another system. And those three forms are, well, the first one is conduction. Now, conduction happens when the jiggliness of the molecules, when the molecules or the atoms collide with each other and the jiggliness just spreads through uh, the material. So let's say you had like a, like a steel rod and you put a you know a Bunsen burner let's just draw a picture like have a little Bunsen burner right there and you've got a flame that is turned on so here's the in the hose and 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 so the, the gas comes in it comes in here and you and this gets really really hot now what happens if you look at it from the point of view of, uh, I mean, the, the, the atoms that are in here, let's just have a whole array of atoms. Now what happens to atoms when they get hot? What does it mean to, well, it means that these atoms are moving faster. Let me zoom in. These atoms right here, they start jiggling around really fast. Not enough to melt, although if you got it hot enough, it would actually melt, right? You can melt steel. But they're jiggling around, and then they hit this guy, and then this guy hits this guy, and this guy hits this guy, and the jiggliness just spreads through the material. So that if you're holding it, you know, let's say you, you, you're, you're touching this, like a frying pan on a, on a stove. You put a frying pan on a stove, and if, if it has a metal handle especially, um, the handle gets hot and that's because the heat the thermal energy is heating through the material itself so it's conduct we call that conduction the heat is conducting right through the material okay um, so the the high temperature starts very high and it conducts into the lower and just makes the molecules jiggle faster and faster so that's conduction uh, another way of transferring the uh, uh, thermal energy is called convection. And this happens in a fluid, okay, convection. Uh, if I had a, have a hot plate or a stove, here's my hot plate, and I put like a big beaker on it, and um, I turn it on. Well, heat starts flowing into the water. Let's put water on there. But here's what happens. Um, you, uh, this water d here close to the uh, hot plate is at a higher temperature than the water up here. And what happens is that the water expands a little bit because it's hotter. The, the water molecules are jiggling a lot faster here than they are up here. And so they push against each other and they push each other away from each other through their collisions, their fast moving collisions. And, um, and they push each other away so they become a little bit less dense. Well, the, the water up here is cold. Um, and more dense, the water down here is hot and a little bit less dense, and so that le that less density gives it some buoyancy, and the hot water will try to rise, and that means that the cold has to descend. 
So the hot water will go up, the cold water has to come down and take its place, and you get a circulation. Of, and then this hot water will actually cool off a little bit, and you'll get convection. You'll get this stirring up of the um, hot will go up, and then cold will go down, and you'll get these little convection cells in here. So this happens in a fluid, uh, whether uh, that fluid is a liquid or the fluid is a gas. You can actually, in science, we call a gas would be a, a fluid. Now you see this in hot air balloons, right? You, 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 you heat up a gas, you fill a balloon up with hot gas. Uh, it wants to go up. And it, you can actually ride that little convection uh, you know, right up. So, uh, but it, it, it takes heat and it, and it uh, transfers it up. So you see this in a boiling pot. If you see you know, hot water on a stove, it starts to stir, stir itself in that pot. That's called convection. So conduction is like in a solid and the jiggliness just moves through the molecules. Here the material itself is moving uh, because of differences in density between cold and hot and, 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 and the, that gives buoyancy force and that causes uh, convection. The last one um, is called uh, radiation. And radiation is the transfer of thermal energy through photons. Um, now, uh, what happens here is, and, and you, you've done this if you, if you have a nice um, campfire, right? And so you've got, you know, some, some, you know, logs on a, on a campfire, some sticks and stuff like this. And, and, it's, and it's burning, you've got a little nice little flame like this and you're sitting around this campfire and, um, and you put your hands, you know, you know like the, here's your ha hands, you put your hands up and you go, oh, it feels good. Okay, so here's your arm. So you put your hand up against it because what happens if you have a really, and, the, and you can really notice this if there's a, a, an extreme temperature difference, that the heat energy will radiate out a, 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 as photons. Now, if you go outside right now, it's like the, the clouds have broken, so you have light, nice sunshine. You can, you know, you go outside and you feel the warmth of the sun on your face, okay, or on your skin. You go out there and feel. Well, that's because um, uh, heat it can uh, flow from the surface of the sun to Earth through uh, this process called radiation. And it's, it's uh, little packets of energy called photons. And we're going to study that later on. But whenever you kind of feel heat, like something's really hot, and you put your hands up, and you can just feel it radiating into your skin, OK, that's radiation. And it's, 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 it's a, a form of light. It's a form of electromagnetic radiation. Um, now, now um, it's radiation that warms the Earth. Right? If you have, like, if you have over here, you have the, uh, you know, the sun shining, and way out here in space, there's the Earth. Okay, so here's the sun, and 93 million miles away is the Earth. Well, there's no material here, so there's there's nothing to conduct the heat from the sun to the Earth, and there's no fluid out here. There's no gas or or uh, there's no um, liquid, <laughs> obviously, between the sun and the earth. So how does the heat get from the sun to the earth? It's through, uh, well, light, uh, but also a light that we can't see. If the wavelength of the light is a little bit too long so that our eyes can't detect it, it's called infrared. And uh, infrared light is a form of uh, transferring heat energy uh, uh, across space. So this is, here we have Q, look like this. Let me uh, zoom out and put too much in. So here we have Q, that is heat being transferred. Here we have Q, heat being transferred through conduction, and here we have Q being transferred as photons of little energy packets. Um, and that's, uh, these are the three ways that heat can flow. 
And in all of them, in all of them, it happens because there's a temperature difference. The Earth is cooler than the Sun, so you have um, radiation of, of heat. If the Earth was hotter than the Sun, heat would flow the other way, but thankfully, the Earth is not hotter than the Sun. Um, convection and conduction all happens because there's a temperature difference. Okay. Oh, by the way, um, you are giving off infrared light right now. I mean, uh, the military uses this fact that anything that, that has a temperature, has a higher temperature than the environment around it, gives off heat into the environment. And they, uh, and they use that with uh, night vision goggles. You've heard of night vision goggles? Okay, well, these are just goggles you put on, but they're, they're actually like little, have little uh, television cameras on them. But the television cameras, instead of detecting visible light, they detect infrared light. So if you're running around at night, you are, um, uh, you're not giving off any visible light photons because the sun's down, there's no source of, of visible light, but you are at a higher temperature than the environment around you. And so you're giving off heat. And some of that heat is given off through you know, conduction and convection in, into the air around you, but some of it is, is as photons. And, and, and you, we can detect those photons with uh, night vision goggles and then we can uh, take that and make a picture in visible light and we can actually see things uh, at night through uh, temperature differences so it's it's pretty interesting stuff okay now i want to talk about uh heat engines next so new topic here um, well we're still talking about the laws of thermodynamics but if you have um, something at very high temperature and I'm going to call this the high temperature reservoir high temp reservoir that is you've got some source of really really high temperature this could be um, this high temperature source could be um, gasoline exploding in the engine of a car or the boiler on a, on a choo-choo train an old-fashioned steam engine. Then you have a low temperature. This is, and again, this is just right out of the video that you just watched. Low temperature reservoir. This could be the environment outside your car. Well, if you burn gasoline and it gets really super hot, you have a temperature difference, so heat is going to flow from high to low. So we're going to, if we have, you're going to see this symbol, just a, it's just a big circle. And this just represents, this circle represents some complicated machine of some kind. The internal combustion engine of your car or the steam engine on a choo-choo train. And the heat flows through your engine or actually in an internal combustion engine, the, the heat high temperature sources inside the engine itself but we still draw it like this we take some of that heat and this is QH that's the heat flowing out of a high temperature reservoir some of that heat gets can turn get turned into mechanical work okay that is we can apply a force through a distance and that's like a, a piston in a car. You apply a force through a distance, it allows you to get some work out of it. And then what you can't turn into work is heat that gets dumped into the low temperature reservoir. Now this is the, the you know, this is the exhaust pipe on your car. So you're driving your car, okay? Now the work well, you, the high temperature reservoir is the burning gasoline. Creates very, very high temperature. Heat flows out of that high temperature uh, and through the pistons of your engine and so on, you turn some of that into work and that's the turning of your wheels, you know, and uh, some of it, you know, if your headlights are on, you're turning some of that heat energy into light. You know, this is all the stuff you want the car to do. But you can't turn all of it into work. Some of it gets turned, it gets dumped into the low temperature reservoir, the environment. 
you don't believe me, just, uh, you know, uh, run your car for a while and then put your lips on the uh, exhaust pipe, okay? No, don't put your lips on the exhaust pipe. You'll, you'll have big, awful uh, blisters on your lips from it. It is uh, very, very hot. In fact, a friend of mine dumped his motorcycle once and uh, the, uh, it was in the summer, he was wearing shorts and the exhaust pipe of the motorcycle landed on his leg and it just scalded his leg. He has this big scar on his leg, from this big burn he got. So yeah, the exhaust pipe gets really, really hot. So it's still, this is still a, a pretty high temperature. It turns out that we can't turn all of the heat energy flowing out into work. It turns out we can only turn about 20, 25% in a car, motorcycle, about 25% of the heat energy gets turned into something useful. The rest of it gets dumped into the environment. Now, the first law of thermodynamics Oops, let me uh, zoom out so you can see it. The first law of thermodynamics says this. Hey, it's just conservation of energy, which we've already dealt with. Okay, conservation of energy. And what it means is that you can't create or destroy energy. All you can do is transfer it from one system into another system. So that means that the heat energy, the energy, uh, the thermal energy flowing out of my high temperature, it has to be accounted for. Some of it gets turned into work and some of it gets dumped into the low temperature reservoir, the environment. But the amount that, of heat that goes into your heat engine, and this, this is uh, your heat engine, anything that turns heat into work or work into heat, or you know, anything that does this, we call it a heat engine, and there are various different kinds of heat engines. There's internal combustion, external combustion. Um, there's this thing called the Stirling engine. There's lots of different, the Carnot engine, which is the, the most efficient one possible. But Lots of different kinds. There's even this, uh, oh, what's it called? A radial engine. But they all do the, basically the same thing. But what we're going to say is this. The heat that comes out of the high temperature reservoir has to be equal to the work that we get uh, out of it plus the heat that flows into the low temperature reservoir. So the, the, the energy that comes into my heat engine has to be equal to the energy that comes out of my heat engine because otherwise I would be violating the conservation of energy. I'd be creating or destroying energy somehow. You can't do that. So you're going to get a problem where they say, okay, if you've got 800 joules of energy flowed out of uh, the high temperature reservoir and we got you know 200 joules of work out of it, how much heat flowed into the high, the low temperature reservoir? So you just say, okay, 800 minus 200 is 600. It has, it has to add up. So it's pretty easy. This is really actually pretty easy. Okay, now the second law of thermodynamics is a little bit more complicated. And it's stated in several different ways. There's several ways of expressing the second law. The first one is uh, something we've already talked about. Um, heat flows, if you have a, a temperature that's really high, heat will flow to low. So here's your heat. Your heat always flows from high temperature to low temperature. Okay. You'll never have, you can't create a machine that will end up forcing more heat to flow from low to high than from high to low. Okay, and, um, and this is the idea of entropy. Now here's why, we've already kind of discussed this before, I'll just briefly um, go over this. If, if you have a temperature difference from a temperature difference, that means that 
if you've got two objects that are in contact with each other, the molecules over here on average are moving a lot faster, right? then if you have low temperature over here, these guys aren't moving nearly as fast. Okay. Now, if you let one of the ways of, of transferring heat energy, either conduction, convection, or radiation, if you let one of those three things happen, what are you going to end up with after time goes by? Well, this high the thermal energy is going to transfer from here over to here and what you're going to end up with is you know these guys being you know just all kind of the same just kind of randomly all this you know there's not if you wait long enough if you took a look at this stuff over here it's not going to look any different than this stuff over here and there's a probabilistic reason for that. I mean, um, you. Uh, I mean, it's just a matter of the of the the odds of how these things interact and 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 uh, collide with each other. There's no way that you're going to have a situation where these guys are going to start moving slower, so these guys have to move faster. I mean, that wouldn't violate the first law. What if I transferred energy out of low temperature into high temperature? You'd say, well, um, hey, energy is conserved. I didn't create or destroy energy, so I'm good on the first law. But that violates the second law because you know what? That just doesn't happen unless you force it to happen. Now, there is this thing called a refrigerator. Okay, now this is one of the most difficult things to grasp, and it's very abstract. Uh, but you 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 know you have one in your house. I'm going to have a little high temperature reservoir here, and a low temperature reservoir, and then I've got some kind of heat engine in there. But this heat engine is going to work in reverse. It's going to be a refrigerator. And what we're going to do is we're going to make something that's already cool. We're going to make it colder, right, by putting it into a refrigerator. Now, remember that what's physically happening to the material you put in a refrigerator, you're not violating the, the law of thermodynamics, the second law. That is, when you put something in a refrigerator, the refrigerator, the environment in the refrigerator is colder than your stuff. So heat flows out of it. But you got to extract that heat out of it, your, your refrigerator, the mechanism in your refrigerator, and then it has to dump it into the outside world. So what it ha has to do is take a little bit of heat out of the stuff that's in your refrigerator, and we have to have some kind of mechanism that uh, uh, takes that heat and dumps, you know, deposits it into the high, higher temperature environment. Now I'm not going to go into all of the details of your refrigerator. I don't have time. But what do you have to do to make a refrigerator work? Energy. Yeah, you need to use energy. What happens if you, you don't plug it in? What happens if the power out? Power, my parents, yeah, my, my parents went on a trip. Their, the refrigerator was stocked with food, but they went on a trip for three weeks. They came back and uh, they had all this meat. I think they had a couple of frozen chickens in the freezer of their refrigerator. There was a power outage. And um, and I think it tripped, and then when the power came on, it tripped one of their circuit breakers in the house. Anyway, the refrigerator never turned back on. And they were gone for three weeks. And there was a chicken <laughs> in there. And guess what it did? It rotted. It rotted. And when they got home, though, it was frozen again because somehow here's what happened they left they were on this long trip the refrigerator turned off and it was evidently it was off long enough for the chicken to to thaw 
to rot and then the refrigerator turned back on and it froze it again and they said it reeked and they tried cleaning out the refrigerator but um, they actually just threw the refrigerator away and spent a thousand bucks on a new refrigerator okay so <coughs> so anyway if your refrigerator isn't turned on <coughs> it's not gonna work oh okay oh great thank you I'll put it right here put it right here okay all right so you need to turn it on now what does that mean that means oh sorry about that booby trapped <laughs> uh, that means you got to put energy into it we got to do work so here's my heat out of my low temperature reservoir here's the work I do and then that's got to uh, be deposited into a high temperature reservoir now something had to do this work and it could have been maybe it was ultimately it was another kind of heat engine somewhere in the universe there had to be a big temperature difference something had to generate this electricity to make the refrigerator work maybe it was a solar panel like we have on this building but the solar panel in a way is kind of like a heat engine because where's the high temperature reservoir if you're a solar panel it's the Sun it's the 6,000 Kelvin degree Sun okay or it was um, um, a power plant nearby like a, a, a natural gas power plant but you needed somewhere there had to be another heat engine with a high temperature reservoir and a low temperature reservoir to create this work that made this happen so this had a lot of heat this had heat going in and so when you look at the end result this is the heat that went from high to low in the, in my device that created the electricity in the first place could you open it okay oh. okay and so the heat so we've got this net result of heat flowing from high to low now over here we took a little bit of heat and we made it go from low to high so this represents the heat that I transferred from the low temperature to the high temperature reservoir but what do you notice about the difference between these two overall what's going on in the universe overall there's still a net flow of heat from high to low temperature always now by the way here's another there's a biological example of this okay we human beings are very highly ordered very um, uh, very highly ordered uh, organisms our molecules we are very complicated highly ordered arrangement of molecules and so you would think well that means that we have a um, a very high state of organization or do we violate though the laws of thermodynamics no because overall overall yeah this is kind of like we're kind of like little refrigerators we take energy and we bring it up to a higher state of organization but at the, the expense of the rest of the universe when you eat food when you metabolize you're giving off heat and all that kind of stuff so um, in essence um, you you still don't violate this basic law of thermodynamics and this is the uh, th this idea that heat flows from high to low that we go from a, a highly ordered state to a low more disorganized state we call this entropy okay entropy the idea that things get more disorganized over time okay and it is um, it's a fact of nature now uh, this happens in your everyday life I mean you go let's say you go home and you clean your room okay you put every everything has to be in its place you organize your room 
Well, you say, well, my room, I'm reducing the entropy of my room, right? The room is more organized. It's at a more ordered state, so it has less entropy. So yeah, you decreased. You did this to your room. You made it more organized. But at what cost? Well, what do you have to do when you clean your room? You have to do work. You have to run around. You have to pick stuff up. Uh, uh, you, have, you, you had to eat food and, or, and you're burning that food up and you're, you're increasing the disorder of the universe while you, you're increasing the disorder of the universe while you're decreasing the or, uh, disorder of your room. And th the, um, the amount that you disorder the universe is greater than the amount that you reorder your room. So if you want an excuse not to clean your room, you can tell your parents, look, I could clean my room, and yeah, I would decrease the entropy of my room, but I'm going to increase the entropy of the rest of the universe much more than I'm, I'm decreasing the entropy of the room. So the universe is just a little bit better off if I just sit here on the couch. Okay, and from a physics point of view, you would be absolutely correct. Okay, so you can tell them I told you, you know. Of course, maybe I'll get a phone call about that but anyway so um, this these are very abstract ideas we're not going to go into the depths of this but uh, someday you might um, engineers um, study this stuff in, in a great uh, in a lot of detail and it's pretty interesting stuff okay that's it <laughs>